It's time to talk about stars. All right, so we're scientists here. We're astronomers. We want to study the stars, so we need to observe them, and we need to measure them. We need to measure precise quantities about the stars, so, so we want to measure things about the stars. One of the first things I want to do about a star is figure out how far away it is. Distance. How do I measure the distance to a star? Well, the process, you know, if I'm measuring the distance in our solar system, that's relatively easy. I could measure the distance to the planet Venus by, we can send out a pulse of radio waves and send them out and then they bounce off the surface of Venus and they come back. It's a radar process and then we can measure the amount of time. We know how fast light travels and so we can measure the distance to the planet Venus or the planet Mars. And from that we can then figure out all the distances in our solar system. The first measurements were made of a process of triangulation sort of thing during eclipses and all that. But the stars are much too far away from that. The stars are... If you sent a pulse of radio waves out to them, uh, you'd be waiting a long time for it before it came back. The way we measure the distance to the nearby stars, the stars you can visibly see with your eyes in the sky, um, see with the naked eye, is a process of triangulation. And so how, you, how does triangulation work? What's that, what that means? So I have a star out here. I want to measure the distance to this star. And I need to measure uh, the angle to this star from two different perspectives. Now, I could measure, you know, like from one side of the Earth. I, I'm, here I am in America, and then I call up my friend over in Europe, and we both point our telescopes at a star. But the thing is, if we did that, the stars are so fantastically far away that we would measure basically the same angle. We would, they're so far away, we wouldn't be able to see any difference in angle. So we need our observers farther away than that. And so what we do is we measure the angle to the star at two different times of year, when the Earth is on opposite sides of the Sun. So the Sun is here, this drawing is not to scale. In reality, the star would be really far away. But here, here's the Sun, it's giving off its light energy out into space. The Earth is orbiting around the Sun, and let's say here is, say, June, when the Earth is on this side of the Sun, and here is December, when the Earth is on that side of the Sun. And so I measure the angle to that star in June, and then six months later I measure the angle to that star, and I find that it's a different angle. The star is not in the same direction. It's, you know, if it was in the same direction, it would be that way, but it's not. It's, it's over here. So I find that there is a shift in angle. So I measure the shift in angle to a star over the course of a year. So it's going to shift back and forth. So if I look at a star very, very carefully in the sky and is a relatively nearby star, then as the Earth goes around the Sun, that star will appear to wobble back and forth, to move back and forth in a yearly pattern, six months to the right, six months to the left, that sort of thing. Now, it's not the star that's moving. It's weird that's moving. The Earth is moving around the Sun. And since our perspective is changing, then that causes that star, if it's a relatively nearby star, to move back and forth by some amount. And then the farther away it is, the left, the less it shifts back and forth. So we measure the shift in angle to a star over a year, or six months would give you the data, over six months. And this is called the parallax angle of the star. Parallax angle, we call it the letter P. And this allows us to calculate the distance to the stars. We know the distance to the sun. There's 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers to the sun. And of course, it's twice that. And so we can calculate this thing. The parallax angle is actually half. Uh, P is half of the, the angular shift over the course of this. So the parallax angle P is half of this. Half of the shift. And then we can calculate this out. And we have defined the distances. When astronomers are talking about distances to stars, you know, in science fiction movies, it's all about light years. A light year is the distance the light travels in a year. Not a measure of time, it's a measure of distance. So science fiction movies, it's all about light years. But if I'm an astronomer, astronomers all talk about parsecs. There's 3.26 light years in one parsec, and why, why, why would they do that? Well, it makes this calculation really easy. Let me show you how that works. If I want to measure the distance to a star, in parsecs, distance to a star in parsecs, parsecs, is equal to 1 divided by the parallax angle, P. Parallax angle, which is half of the amount of the angle that it shifts back and forth. So, for instance, suppose I observe a star in the sky very, very carefully, and I find that it shifts. Oh, the parallax angle must be measured in arc seconds. 
arc seconds, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny little angle. That's ridiculously small. Remember, there are 360 degrees in a circle. There are 60 arc minutes in every degree, and there are 60 arc seconds in every arc minute. So this is an absolutely infinitesimal sort of an angle sort of a thing. But uh, astronomers can measure this. So if I measure, suppose that I get a parallax angle of, oh, I don't know, one-tenth. 0.1 arc seconds. Uh, we use the same symbol as you use for inches. And then, so I would just do 1 divided by 0 0.1. 1 divided by 0 0.1 is 10. So this star would be a distance of 10 parsecs away from us. If I want to convert this to light years, let's see, let's do that. If I want to convert this to light years, where should I do this? Okay, let's convert 10 parsecs to light years. I know that there are 3.26 uh, light years is equal to one parsec, and so I take my 10 parsecs, and let's see, I need to either multiply by 3.26 or divide by 3.26. In order to do this, I'm going to write this out as a ratio, 3.26 light years divided by one parsec. If I write it in this way, ah, parsecs cancel out, oh, so I multiply across. If I put the 3.26 on top, that's going to give me light years. 10 times 3.26 is 32.6 light years, and that's the distance to this star. And so this is how we measure the distance to the stars in the sky. It took a long time to do this. The ancient Greeks knew the general idea, but they were unable to measure stellar parallax. That was one of the reasons that Claudius Ptolemy thought, thought the Earth was the unmoving center of all things, and that astronomers thought that for a thousand years after him was because if the Earth moved, then we would expect to see some sort of parallax angle. We would expect the stars to shift back and forth uh, as we move around the Sun every year, or at least to appear to, and they don't, at least to the naked eye. It wasn't until 1838 that the German astronomer, a Bessel, was able to actually measure the six months back and forth shift that the, the nearby stars make due to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Today, we have computers and all sorts of things, and so we can measure this very accurately. And we can measure, it's absolutely amazing, we can now measure distances out to on the order of a thousand parsecs and more as a result of really, really amazingly accurate things. So that's how we measure the distance to the stars. All right, what else do I want to measure? Here's another interesting thing I want to measure about the stars. I want to measure the brightness of a star. Well, that's very easy. Brightness is a simple sort of thing. Brightness is what we measure. That's what you see with your eye. If I look at one star, and ooh, this one looks brighter than that. So that's, that's how bright a star looks from our perspective, is measured from our perspective. But that's not really what I want. If I want to understand the star, I mean, brightness is based on two things. It's based on the total amount of light energy the star is putting out and the coincidence of just how far away it happens to be. If I have see two stars and it's like, oh, this one's brighter than the other, is, is the brighter one giving off more total light energy? Maybe. Or maybe it's just closer to us. That could do it too. So brightness is based, it's, so brightness is from our perspective. It's based on, on light energy given off and also distance. And distance is, you know, all the stars are kind of sprinkled throughout space. Who knows which one's going to be closer or farther away. So what I really want is the luminosity of a star. Luminosity. That is the total quantity of light energy that a star emits. Total per second. Quantity of light energy. Energy a star emits. We can measure the, you know, the total quantity of light energy a star emits per second. It is measured in watts. Just like a light bulb. You know, if I've got a 100 watt light bulb, it's putting out, you know, 100 joules of energy in every second. Well, I can measure the luminosity of the sun in watts. It's a really big number, but it, it's, it's there. That's what I'm talking about. So, brightness and luminosity, luminosity is what, if I want to understand stars, if I want to understand what's going on inside stars, I want luminosity. That's what I want. But what I see in the sky, if I put a light meter, a little digital light meter on my telescope, you know, beep gives me a reading, that's telling me brightness. So how do I get luminosity? Well, I get luminosity so I can measure brightness. That's what I measure with my telescope. That's easy. To calculate that, I need to know how a star gets less bright with distance. I need to know the relationship between brightness and luminosity and distance. And basically what happens with a star, the light spreads out evenly in all directions over a sphere. 
So the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi times the radius of the sphere squared. Well, in this case, the radius is the distance between us and the star. So the brightness of a star is going to be the luminosity, total amount of light energy it's emitting per second, divided by the area it's spread out over. It's spread out over a sphere. So this is 4 pi times the distance squared. Now what I really want is the luminosity. The luminosity then, okay, so if I, I, brightness is what I measure with a light meter, distance is what I get from parallax, and so luminosity is going to be 4 pi times the distance squared times the brightness. And this allows me to now I can really compare stars. And, and this is interesting. This says that brightness is related to the distance squared. So if I took a star and I moved it so it was twice as far away, well, 2, two squared, twice as far away, 2 squared is 4, 2 times 2 is 4, so that star would be 1 fourth as bright as it used to be. If I take a star and I move it so it's 3 times as far away as it was, then it would be 1, let's see, 3, 3 squared, 3 times 3 is 9, it would be 1 ninth as bright as it used to be. If I took a star and I moved it so it's 4 times as far away as it used to be, 4 squared, 4 times 4 is 16, it would be 1 sixteenth as bright as it used to be. Okay, so we know about that. So those are quantities about the star. I can measure the distance to a star. I can measure the luminosity of a star. How about temperature? Temperature. Um, as we've studied before in the course, well, stars put out a thermal black body spectrum, and I could use Wien's law. So that would work. Wien's law. Turns out that it's annoying to do that. Then you have to measure carefully the brightness of all these different wavelengths, and there's a wonderful shortcut. There's just an awesome shortcut. Turns about, about uh, 150 years ago, people are studying stars and looking at things, and they discovered that, uh, and those spectral lines, those absorption lines they see in the stars vary from star to star. So Wien's law is one way to do it, but, you know, this is too hard. Too hard. It, we, we can do it, and we do it in some cases, but the easy way, the shortcut, is based on spectral lines. Spectral lines. And they found that there were different patterns of spectral lines in different stars. At first, they thought this would meant that, well, different stars are made of different elements. Turned out later, you know, because in some stars, the iron lines are strong. Ooh, this star must be made of iron. And then in some stars, the, I don't know, the helium lines are strong. And in some stars, the carbon lines are strong. They're different strengths. And so initially, people thought, oh, all stars are made of different things wrong. Turned out that all stars are made of basically the same thing. All stars are made of about 70% hydrogen, roughly 30% helium, and then, you know, 2% or 3% or 1% of the other stuff. Turns out the reason why these lines were strong in some stars and not as bright line in the other were because their difference in temperature. As certain temperatures exist and these lines get very strong and then they fade back and all that sort of thing. So they invented this whole system of classifying stars based on the strength of different spectral lines. Um, that originally went A, B, C, D, E, F, something like that, and then they realized, oh, wait a minute, this isn't telling us anything about chemical composition, it's telling us about the heat of a star, it's, it's surface temperature, and so there was a pattern here, so they reorganized it and threw out some letters, and so the spectral lines give us spectral type. Spectral type. So based on spectral lines, we can classify a spectral type, and that tells us what the temperature it is. And this is an easy thing to automate. You put it on the telescope, the computer says, oh, we got these lines, it's this spectral type, therefore it's this temperature. The spectral types are O, B, A, if I can write, A, F, G, K, and M. The hottest stars are type O stars, the coolest stars are type M stars. And so then we can classify that based on these letters. I can even then throw a number on top of that. So like a B0 star would be hotter than a B2 star, uh, which is hotter than a B9 star, and then an A0 star takes off from this. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the, the listing of the spectral types of stars. And so, well now we've learned some things. Okay, so we've learned how to measure this distance to a star, the luminosity of a star, the surface temperature. No, this is not core temperature. This is surface temperature of a star. And, um, and then I guess I mentioned along the way, we can, the spectral lines, temperature, we can calculate chemical composition. And we find that all stars have basically the same chemical composition. 70% hydrogen, roughly 30% helium, and a couple percent of the other elements mixed in there. So now we know how to make basic measurements about the stars.